Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Empathy Podcast. I'm so glad you're joining me today. My name's Leanne Butterworth. I'm from Empathy First. Now, if you don't know, Empathy First run workshops about empathy training. And empathy training is all about learning about what empathy is, why it's important, and how to communicate with empathy to make people feel heard, valued, and visible. Now, today we're talking about empathy and politics with state MP Amy McMahon from South Brisbane. And it is the most lovely discussion about the value of empathy from politicians, why it makes you a better politician, creating better social change, but also empathy for politicians. And we're going to learn a little bit about what it's like to be a politician. So without any further ado, my name's Leanne Butterworth. This is the Professional Empathy Podcast. You can find us at empathyfirst.com.au. Hello and welcome to the Empathy Podcast. My name's Leanne Butterworth and today we're speaking about empathy and politics with Amy McMahon. Amy McMahon is the Greens MP for South Brisbane and she was voted in last year, so 2020. Welcome, Amy. Thanks for having me. So today we're talking about empathy and politics and I know a lot of people do not put these two words in the same sentence. They don't think they belong in the same sentence. Um, so today I would really like to explore whether you think they belong in the same sentence. Do they do they have anything to do with, with each other? Is there any benefit to empathy in politics? So, Amy, could you please give us a little bit of a background as to who you are and how we've come to be chatting today? Sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm the MP for South Brisbane, um, which is a really lovely um, pocket of the world, and I got elected at the last election in October 2020, so I'm still quite fresh, still learning a lot, but it has been an amazing journey since then, representing the people of South Brisbane in the Queensland State Parliament and um, doing all sorts of work. And if you're familiar with um, sort of Greens politics, you know some of the stuff we're talking about, housing, um, you know, education, um, inclusivity, public transport, climate change, renters' rights, that kind of stuff. Um, so it's been a really exciting time. My pathway into politics um, was, I, I mean, I never really thought that I would be a politician. It was not really a goal for my life, but I did have the idea that I would um, be involved in, in social change and political change in some form. Um, that had been sort of clear to me since I was young. And I sort of looked around for different pathways for how I was going to make that change in the world, make the world a better place, um, you know, address the kind of big inequalities that we see, um, you know, in the society that we live in and dealing with capitalism, racism, sexism. So I always thought I would be doing something in that space. I headed down the path of becoming an academic um, before I had a real sort of crisis moment where I thought I'm, I'm not really doing the work that I would like to do and not really connecting with people in the way that I really wanted to. And I had some friends who were involved in the in the Greens. Um, I knew our councillor Jonathan Stree from Uni, and slowly got more involved in the Greens and going door knocking and talking to people and connecting with people from all walks of life. And that um, led me to put my hand up for pre selection a few years ago. And um, I ran in twenty seventeen and then ran again. 20 and um, off the back of a, of a huge campaign um, with hundreds of volunteers having conversations um, and we were successful. Um, and so here I am having a conversation with you today. Lovely. Oh, congratulations. And the word that you mentioned a few times um, is conversations. Mm. And yeah. the definition of empathy that we use is the ability to share and understand the feelings of another person and respond appropriately. Mm. And from the sound of it, I mean, I'm in social enterprise, so mm. that, that's my other bubble. Yeah. But empathy in social enterprise is listening to the people. So you're not designing at people or for people, yeah. you're designing with people yes. and creating yeah. social change with people. 
not really at people. So that's the yeah. that's the definition that that mm. we use. And by the sound of it, it's an interest in people mm. that's gotten you here, not an interest in power. Is that that's common nice. yeah. amongst politicians? Yeah. Um, look, I think there would be a mix of people in in all levels of of government. Um, you know, I've definitely encountered um, people who are um, career politicians. I guess always had an idea that they would be in parliament and are, are very ambitious in that way. And have met lots of people who are very passionate about their local communities, and that has what really was has driven them. Um, and, you know, we'll have come through various different um, professions and pathways to get into politics. And, um, you know, even when you turn on the news at the end of the day, you'll see those different kinds of people, um, definitely people who are, um, you know, feeding with big corporations and are kind of mixing in these, um, you know, upper echelon kind of circles and the other people who are really grounded and connected to their community. Um, so there's definitely a mix. So do you think that if we go back to our original question, does mm. everything belong in politics? Yeah, I I think it has to. And I think um, this is probably one of the things that is lacking in politics. And I, I think maybe it's conceptualised differently in political spheres and probably conceptualised differently by everyday people. But if you're not connected and committed to fighting for people and everyday people, then you're going to be, you know, fighting for big corporations. You're going to be fighting for um, big companies to make profits. You're going to be fighting for the billionaires at the top at the expense of everyday people at the bottom. And that's really what we've got at the moment. We have a political and economic system that isn't geared for the vast majority of people. Um, and that's, you know, there's questions around power and privilege and connection that, um, that make up our political system, really. And so I think if you're lacking that connection, you're lacking that empathy, I mean, you look around and you see the outcomes of that, you see the massive inequality that we're facing, you see the, the big systemic injustices that lots of people are facing, you think, you know, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. So then what are the benefits that you've seen since you've come on board of bringing a more empathetic approach to South Brisbane? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you, you mentioned the conversations before. A big part of the Greens' approach to politics and how we've been running campaigns, election campaigns, but also campaigns on different issues is about trying to connect with people. And um, one of the big things we do is go door knocking. So we go and knock on people's doors. And traditionally, I think people's experiences of door knocking is someone coming to your door and giving you a bit of a spiel about why you should or shouldn't vote a particular way. But the approach that we take is to ask a lot of questions, to ask people, well, how do you feel about politics? What's going on in your local area? What's going on in your life? And then from there, draw out kind of points of commonality and connection. And that has been the basis of a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last few years is to have these in-depth conversations with people and find like, okay, maybe we don't agree on, um, you know, this economic question, but we do agree on this local issue. And from there we can start to have a conversation and build a connection. One of the most useful questions is just asking people, what do you think about politics in general? And the, the most common response we get is people laughing in our faces because they think politics is a joke, um, politicians are just out for themselves and, and this is their reality and this is people's experiences of politics. They've found um, politicians to be very disconnected from their lives. They think politics is this thing that goes on in Canberra and it goes on in George Street and the decisions that are made uh, you know, aren't made for everyday people. And that has been a really, really interesting point of connection, being able to say, to people, you know what, your your instincts about politics are correct. Um, we feel the same way. This, this system is, is really broken. And what can we together do to change that? And maybe that starts with your vote. Maybe you volunteer. Maybe you have a conversation with other people in your lives. 
but those conversations that are built on asking those questions and finding those points of commonality um, have been really important and have been, you know, the really the driving force behind our election wins, but also the other campaigns that we've been running um, around things around housing, um, around um, sustainable property development, finding those points of commonality, um, finding those things that people care about locally and systemically and going from there. So by the sound of it, like you said, door knocking previously was going and spruiking and speaking at people, whereas if you're asking yeah. them questions. But also the difference then between face-to-face conversations and making people feel heard as opposed to surveys, let's say. Yeah. What yeah. do you what do you find is the biggest difference then between your uh, your constituents' experience? Mm. I think face to face conversations are the the crucial part of this. Being able to see another human being, you know, really be able to listen to them clearly and um, and be with them in that moment is you know that kind of personal connection is so important and something you can't get from anything else really. I mean, um, talking on the phone gets close, but even that doesn't really equate to what you get from talking to someone face-to-face. Obviously, over the last 18 months, it has been really hard given COVID, but what we found was um, once things opened up and we were able to go and knock on people's doors, people were really uh, excited and keen to have that that face-to-face connection. And um, for us, it's also a way of demonstrating that we do care about the community, that we care about what people think to the point where, you know, we would take out half of our Saturday to go and walk around the streets and try and find um, people and have conversations with them or, you know, go and stand by the river and chat to people as they're on their morning walk and yeah. um, being visible in that way and being able to have that face- face-to-face connection has been crucial. Yeah. So the benefits then, I mean, it sounds like the benefit to the individual of being empowered in a system, Mm. of having a voice and understanding what's going on and feeling as though they're valued as a member of that community and then building that community that you don't really get from someone sitting at home filling in a server. No, exactly right. Um, And, you know, we live in a really atomised society, you know, we're very individualised, you know, on a, in a hot summer, we're all at home running our air conditioners, like behind closed doors. Yeah, with um, the curtains shut. <laughs> with the curtains shut, yeah. And just like, you know, the kind of connections that we've had historically, like to a church or a trade union or through community groups, like a lot of that has kind of morphed and changed and eroded in a lot of ways over recent decades. And people are looking for opportunities to connect, you know, we do live in a society where it's, it is really individualised, like, you know, you've got to work really hard for yourself, like, the welfare system isn't really going to look after you, um, the public transport system is too lousy and so you have to drive yourself around, like, all these little things that contribute to people feeling um, pretty disconnected and trying to find ways to break that down and say, you know what, if, if you're feeling frustrated, you should know that there's lots of other people who feel frustrated. And you mentioned, like, that sense of empowerment to say, like, your opinions are valid, your instincts about politics are valid, and the vision that you have and the ideas that you have are valid as well. And there's a space here to come together and talk about it with other people um, and don't feel alone. I think a lot of people, you know, we do have this culture in Australia, like, don't talk about politics, but when people get an opportunity to talk about it, um, it's transformative. Yeah, yeah. And I, the trouble with these podcasts that I do is every time somebody says something, I go, well, yeah, like, doesn't everybody, this is so obvious <laughs> that you go, well, why are we even doing this podcast? Because this is so obvious that everybody <laughs> should know it. Yeah, like, yeah, it yeah. makes perfect sense to engage yeah. the community, to go out mm. and talk to people and listen to what it is that people genuinely care about and for good or for bad or how they feel disengaged and and what their challenges are and validating and valuing those. What do you think the resistance is 
to empathy and politics? Um, I think there is this idea that, um, you know, we have these views and opinions and you're just, particularly in the Greens, like this sense that like everywhere you go you'll face hostility. Like everywhere you go you're going to face, like you're going to knock on the door of people who are like, we should ban immigration. You're going to knock on the door of people who are like, I love coal. Um, and sometimes you do, but um, more often than not, you're knocking on the door of people who are just like us, you know, have, um, you know, similar kinds of um, goals for their life. Sure, there's differences of opinion, but there's always these threads of commonality. And I think a lot of political parties kind of view the, the community as like, this hostile body that is something to be managed as opposed to mm-hmm. what it is that that makes up the world. Um, and so you're going out and, you know, a lot of other parties are like running focus groups and message testing to try and find like the perfect thing that you can say that, um, that you know, will, will get people's votes and, um, you know, you know, doing things on social media and, um, you know, kind of trying to manipulate the way people think about things as opposed to just going out and talking with people Mm -hmm. and having this view that, like, sure, you might face some lousy views, like you probably will face some people who are sexist and racist, but if you kind of persist a little bit, you can nearly always find some points of commonality. I think the other thing in politics is, I mentioned before, like there has been this big capture by corporations and, you know, the pursuit of profit isn't always commensurate with empathy and connection um, and justice. And, you know, a lot of, uh, like, big parties are taking huge amounts of money from fossil fuel companies, from banks, from property developers, and then you end up with decision-making that's geared those companies rather than for everyday people um, and you know that the voices of everyday people are lost when there's these pathways for people who are able to pay for influence to have a say in politics mm. um, and you know a lot of a, a lot of politicians are spending a lot of time connecting with their communities but um, a lot aren't as well a lot of are just in their offices they might go along to to events and so on, but aren't doing that kind of grassroots work um, yeah. to really connect. Yeah. yeah. And by the sound of it, that's more of a systemic issue that mm. those sorts of transactions are allowed to take place or that they're prioritised. Um, and it sounds like there's almost that, that lack of humanity. I mean, to me, that's where a fear campaign comes from is mm, that's mm. what's going to get the votes, that's what drives people. So we're going to use that without yeah. truly thinking about what the what the consequences are of that or what the personal yeah. implications are of those types of campaigns. That's and it's right. coming back to that humanity piece and people are messy mm. and imperfect but they're human and they're not mm. just this homogenous mass of voters. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, And you mentioned there like this is a systemic problem in the way that our political system is set up and the things that politicians and political parties are allowed to do um, that has been developing over decades. Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, I mentioned before, like, the decline of the trade unions has been a big part of this. Um, you know, hardly anyone is, is part of a union anymore, so that kind of pathway and demonstration of power and the role that that played in politics has really declined and has allowed these big companies to kind of rush in and fill the void. So we do have these kind of big systemic things to deal with that would help, um, you know, with recreating a political system that actually works for everybody. Yeah. And is that something that from the get-go, I mean, with your team and your staff and your volunteers that you've written down and said, look, this is who we are, this is what we stand for, and is that something that you've done or is it a like a Greens policy. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, like, the way we approach door knocking, this is something that has evolved over years as we've talked with more people and refined our approaches and found ways to build that kind of connection-building conversation into what we do. And then the Greens more broadly have 
um, you know, we have some kind of underlying pillars that drive the kinds of decisions that we make and um, you know, things like social justice, grassroots democracy that have um, helped to guide the kind of policies that we have over time. And I think that has been a useful kind of touch point um, that has led to things like, you know, the Queensland Greens don't take any corporate donations, for example. Um, and we do have this commitment to, to grassroots democracy and connecting with people on the ground. Um, but there's definitely been, uh, over the last few years, the Greens have, I think, become much more sophisticated in their approach and, you know, historically have had that real fear of, you know, there's just hostility out there everywhere and, you know, everyone, every door you knock on is going to be like someone who works for forestry. And so we have done a lot of work to change I guess the, the, the approaches of, of candidates and volunteers to be much more connected and it has transformed um, the party, it has transformed individuals, it certainly transformed my life um, and, you know, there's, there's always more work to do um, but, yeah, it's been an incredible journey. Yeah. To me as a Joe Blanc member of the public, it feels like there's a greater level of transparency with mm. the Greens that's coming through. It's not perfect. Um, mm. I think there's probably more work to be done, but it definitely mm. feels like, I mean, we're in essentially a, a three-party system, mm. but it feels like there's that greater level, especially on social media, mm. of transparency of what, who's voting for what, what you stand for, where you stand on particular issues. So given that you're fairly new in this space, who do you look up to? So who to you stands out in the, let's say, empathy and politics space or just the politics space? Um, who do you look yeah. up to and what are they doing? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm really lucky to be in Parliament beside my colleague, Michael Berkman, um, who is sort of a term ahead of me and um, you know, has been an incredible mentor and um and colleague to have beside me on this journey. Um, our local councillor, Jonathan Sree, that I mentioned before, um, has really transformed politics in this corner of the world and his commitment to um, participatory democracy has really changed um, the way that we approach politics but also the expectations of the community that, that we will be drawn into this process. There will be opportunities for conversation. There will be lots of information that is shared um, from a view that we get better, better decision making when we involve people. Um, and I've been incredibly inspired and I've learned a lot from him all the time. Um, our, our federal senator, Larissa Waters, has mm. been doing amazing work, particularly for women and, and highlighting these inequities as well. Um, I also follow a young um, Greens politician in New Zealand called Chloe Swarbrick. She's in her 20s. She's absolutely incredible um, and has brought this kind of level of um, transparency and like radical honesty to the way that she does politics and the way that she's connected with people. And I um, follow her very closely and I get inspired by a lot of the work that she does. She's been doing amazing work around um, drug law reform and um, just being really honest with people about her own experiences as a young person, with her friends, um, talking a lot about mental health issues as well. Um, and I think, you know, there's there's a challenge for people in the public realm to, you know, have privacy and have your own integrity and have your own life while also being a real person that is yeah. having real-life experiences that inform the kinds of decisions that you make. Um, but, yeah, Chloe is amazing. I, I'd encourage anyone to, to go and look at her work. It feels like if you're an aspiring politician, getting out there and really looking at not only the benefits of this type of politics but also what other people are doing in the space mm -hmm. to become inspired, do you have any advice for potential politicians? Yeah, I think one of the key things is, um, you know, if you want to run for a particular area, finding ways to be really connected to the community, finding ways, you know, volunteering with local organisations, having a good sense about what's going on at the grassroots, like what artistic endeavours are going on, like what what neighbourhood houses are doing, 
um, you know, what First Nations communities have you got in your local area and being really connected there and um, and having conversations with people for years until you have a really good sense about what your community is all about and what people um, care about and then thinking, okay, what kind of systemic change do we need um, to address the kinds of issues that, that people are facing? Yeah. You know, we had conversations with people here in South Brisbane for years and years and years before we were able to win. But that time was about understanding very deeply what's going on in this community. And so I think for anyone who's, who is thinking about politics, that's where you should start, building those connections with, um, you know, your specific community that you care about. You know, it can't yeah. just be any community. It has to be somewhere that, that you really care about and building up those grassroots connections. Um, yeah. And making sure you've got a good support network around yourself as well, um, political mentors, having a political ideology that you can be coming back to. Um, I mentioned like the Greens have these kind of four pillars that guide a lot of the work that we do and it does keep you very grounded because every decision you make, you're coming back to those underlying ideas, you're coming back to that um, policy that's guiding you and helping you make decisions. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of political parties that are, you know, kinds of cults of personality, a lot of smaller parties that don't really have a core ideology. And so the decisions that they're making there are quite bizarre and random sometimes and not always focused. But I think we're really lucky that we've kind of got this underlying base um, that can inform us. So I think those two things, kind of connecting with your community, having um, you know, these these overarching ideas that can help guide you. Yeah. It sounds actually very similar to the advice that we give to young social entrepreneurs is don't yes. just swoop in and hope for the best. It's get yes. in, understand the problem, understand mm. the beneficiary, mm. make sure that you're connected yeah. to yeah. the community and the problem yes. and that you've got an interest in it, a genuine interest yes. in people. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot about empathy from politicians. Now, I want to talk a little bit about empathy for politicians because I don't know that I've ever <laughs> heard that conversation at all, ever in yeah. the United States. So yeah. you've only been an MP for a little while, but you've been doing the legwork for quite a while. What are your favourite parts of the job so far? Oh, my favourite parts of the job are like getting to go and connect with the community and getting to go and support, you know, really interesting stuff that is going on on the ground. Um, I've got a, a background in sociology, so I am just in, interested in people and what's going on. And, um, you know, I feel incredibly privileged in this job that I get to talk to all kinds of people. Like I, I've just come this morning from um, a refugee legal support organisation um, we get to go to PNC meetings. We get to go to like food banks and, um, you know, understand what's going on and what we can do to, to help support people. And that kind of grassroots connection, um, is just it, amazing. You know, parliament itself, even though it's just over the river, can sometimes feel very disconnected from the community. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm only a, a 15, 20 minute drive from home to get to Parliament and sometimes it feels like a different country when we're in there. And then when we come out and we get to come back to the electorate and um, get to wander around and talk to people, um, that's really rewarding. Um, and the job is kind of a mix of pushing for this big systemic change, kind of chipping away at this bigger stuff that takes years. But a, a huge portion of the work that we do is really like individual casework in a way. You know, we've got people who are coming to us for support with navigating the legal system or navigating the hospital system or they're having trouble trying to get a visa or, um, you know, they're having some issue in their workplace or with the local council. So we do a lot of just one-on-one -on -one work for people which can range from something we can solve in a day to work that we'll be doing over the course of many months to support people um, and getting some wins on that individual level um, is really what helps us keep going. Because the biggest systemic change, you can't see it happening. It will take years. And so in the, in the meantime, we're kind of nourished by 
what we're able to do um, for individuals uh, yeah. on a day-to-day basis. Sounds incredibly rewarding. Um, mm. What are some of the challenges or stresses that politicians face at the moment? Yeah, um, like if Parliament itself is quite a tough place. I've been quite candid about this, but it is, it's a very combative space. It's very gendered. Uh, for us on the crossbench and particularly in the, in the Greens, it um, can at times be an openly hostile place to be. Uh, and everyone has seen videos of Question Time. And you see this kind of theatrical performance of politics. And, um, you know, the first, I, I knew it was bad, but the first time I saw Question Time, I like turned to Michael Burke and I was like, is this for real? And he's like, oh, this is pretty normal. And um, it was just incredible. Like, And I think one of the things is that, a lot of people in there forget that that isn't the main game. Like no one, no one in the community is watching Question Time. Like no one is is keeping a tally of like such and such said this witty thing or like took someone down um, in a particular way. But I think a lot of people forget that and think that this is the main game. And it is. It's kind of this old style of politics that you know emerged yeah. in the eighteen hundreds, and there's a very particular way of talking. And interacting, and it's horrible. Um, and I sort of have to check myself to make sure that it's not becoming normalised for me. That I'm not like, okay, this is how you talk to other human beings. Um, yeah. So being in that space can be quite hard. And then you know, just the 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 bigger kind of injustices that we're facing. And um, you know, a lot of people will come to us when they have tried every other pathway to try and solve a problem. And their kind of last port of call will be their local MP. And, um, it's just horrible. Some of the things that, that people are, you know, people imminently facing homelessness or people who are, have been waiting months to, to get some urgent surgery or people who have been being bullied at work. Like just awful things that are going on in the world shouldn't be like this. Um, yeah. and kind of pushing for that bigger change. That is really hard. Um, sometimes that, that feels really hard. But knowing that, you know, we've got this movement behind us and we've mm. got lots of people who want this change as well um, is, is kind of helpful. But, um, yeah, I mean, anyone thinking about getting into politics, like don't be naive that it isn't, it isn't hard work. Like it's really long days, really long hours and incredibly rewarding and, like, incredibly privileged position to be in to be able to do this work. Um, yeah. But, yeah, definitely comes to the challenges. So then the value of the colleagues who are on the same page, the value of your team that are on the same page, what's the value? And is this even a conversation that happens, like mental health and self-care of politics or politicians? Is that a thing, the People talk about that or is it just going go? Yeah. Over? I mean, we talk about it and we talk about it within the Greens and with our federal colleagues um, and between ourselves definitely think about, like, how we're looking after each other, ourselves and looking after each other and, and not getting burnt out. Um, but I think that one of the challenges there is, like, the indiv- individual people who are in this position, like, for me, I feel like, I have been given this gift of this job to do this work and so I have to just do everything I can um, yeah. and, you know, squeeze everything out of every hour, every weekend, every evening to try and get the outcomes that we want and, um, you know, I don't want to die wondering, <laughs> you know, if we could have worked harder and so that kind of contradicts some of that, like, Taking time out and not getting not getting burnt out, and that that's a real challenge. Um, yeah. And I think, like, I look around at a lot of my other um, colleagues in Parliament, and I think they're facing similar kinds of challenges. You just there's there's no end to this work. Like, yeah. there is there is it's literally endless. You could work twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, and you wouldn't be. On top of it, you wouldn't be finished. 
Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's just kind of a, a challenging balance. Yeah. But there's definitely conversations, um, you know, between myself and Michael and um, often when I talk to, to Jonathan and people who, you know, are a few years ahead of me saying, like, that's yourself, mm. make sure you're eating well. And, um, you know, I have a, I have a, a useful support network around me. I see, see my family a lot. I, yep. um, you know, have, have a really good GP and a psychologist and all of that. But, um, yep. you know, it won't stop you from working yourself into the ground. Yeah. By the sound, I mean, it's, it's those competing forces. It's, I want to say mm. yes. I want to do all the things. Yeah. Acknowledging yeah. that burnout would be bad for everyone. Yeah, definitely. but then finding yeah. that balance, finding those boundaries, yeah, that, um, so that takes work. It it yeah, takes yeah, it a does. lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that's a real like a practice and a habit to keep coming back to. Um, and I don't think I have the balance right yet. Yet, um, but you know, hopefully building up to something like that and making sure you know I'm connecting with like my non political friends and non political hobbies and. Yeah. Um, you know, reading non political books occasionally uh, yeah. to get their balance right as well. Yeah. And it's just remembering, I think, your own your own humanity in yeah, order to better yeah, serve that's right. the yeah. community around you. This has been such a, a lovely discussion. But what advice do you have for the public when it comes to how they interact with politicians, how they view politicians and politics? It's a great question. There's definitely a part of me that feels like, you know, you don't, you don't ever get into politics by accident. Like you've made some very deliberate decisions over a long period of time to end up in politics. It's never just, you know, it hasn't just fallen in your lap. And so in a lot of ways, like you go in kind of open eyed about, um, what what it's going to be like and what interactions are like with other politicians and with members of the community. And so there's definitely moments where I think like, oh, like, you know, this is this is kind of what we've signed up for and, um, you know, if we're getting trolled online or if we're getting, um, you know, cranky emails, like that is just part of it and it's balanced out with the good that, you know, and the support that, that we're getting. And I think, you know, if people are out there and they're, they're feeling frustrated with politicians and, um, they're feeling like they're not being represented, like, uh, for a lot of people that will be true, you know, for, for a lot of people, you will have a, a local representative who is from a party that takes big corporate donations and isn't really connected to people and, and probably that, um, any kind of criticism or anger that you're feeling is, is probably valid. Um, but yeah, I guess remembering like there are people underneath there and there's like ways to talk to each other. Um, yeah, it's tricky to say because I don't, I don't want to say to people like just, you know, don't just treat your politicians like you would treat your next door neighbor because I think it is a different category and you know, we're being We've been paid by the public, we've served the public, we have a job to do to be representing people. And I want people to hold me accountable as well. Like I want the community to be giving me good feedback. Um, but there's, you know, there's definitely times when you're getting like a, a bunch of emails over the weekend from people being like, COVID's a hoax and how dare you like yeah. strip away our constitutional rights and stuff like that, where you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> We're just trying really hard over here. You know, me and my team are trying really hard. Yeah. Um, so I guess I don't know. Think about the way that the way that you deliver arguments. There's definitely better yeah. ways to get your points across. There's there's useful and unuseful ways to connect with people. Um, yeah. You know, here our door is always open, and we um, try and respond to every email that um, comes in the inbox. So other people will have a different approach. But I think you know, if you have a real goal and you've got um, you know, you've got something you really want to say. There's definitely like different ways to say it. Um, but yeah, when, when I, when I think about empathy for politicians, it's kind of tempered with like my own burning rage at the political system. Yeah. And like moments where I'm like, 
just burn the whole place down and start again. Um, and, you know, yeah, as I said, like no one's gotten in there by accident. And if you're upholding an unjust system, like you do deserve to be criticised um, and, you know, to be done in a, in a way that doesn't attack you personally or your yeah. family um, or your, your health and welfare. But um, holding people to account, um, I think, is important. Yeah, absolutely. And by the sound of it, this podcast could go on for three hours. There is yeah, so yeah, much that we could we could jump into. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I would love nothing more. But, but people don't listen to three hour podcasts. <laughs> but I guess as well, there's that holding people to account, but remembering the humanity. So there is a way to mm. ask. There is a way to speak with empathy. There is a way to treat people mm. as human beings and not yeah. as objects. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I think also in <laughs> what I've seen is a lot of the vitriol that comes comes from people who are very isolated and disempowered. Mm. And yeah. to me it's getting part of your community and mm. empowering yourself to actually potentially make changes around you mm. and feel part of something bigger than yourself rather than mm. sitting back and just projecting. But, yeah. I mean, everybody has their own experience. So yeah. It's, yeah. I think there is that that image or that perception that it's all someone else's fault mm. and it's all. So, I mean, there's lots that we could. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you make a really good point in that, like, a lot of people who are responding, like, in a vitriolic way are, are really disempowered and disconnected. Um, and I think that is important to remember. And, you know, that, as I mentioned before in the door knocking, like, uh, you know, approaching every conversation with an open heart to find those points of connection. And, um, you know, if people are really frustrated, like there will be lots of other things going on that have led to that interaction. You know, it's not just something that I've done or something that the Greens have done or something that the government has done. There's a lot of different layers and layers there. And, yeah, um, yeah like what you mentioned, like finding those, those moments of solidarity and connection is what will make change. Like the, the number one thing that, that makes change is, these big groups of people coming together, working in solidarity, um, you know, across cultural lines, across, um, you know, class lines, across gendered lines to make that change. Um, you're not going to achieve anything just yelling into the void and it's always that solidarity that makes it work. And so, yeah, finding those pathways um, yeah. is, is really powerful. Yeah, and that's, I guess, a way to subvert the powers of the system and the powers mm. of the media and go, no, 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 that's what yeah. that's what's bubbling around up here. That's what you're being told. This yes. is the truth. This is eye yeah. contact. This is that's, transparency yes. and listening yeah. and that's where the magic happens. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, like for, for me change happens with those big grassroots movements and representatives who are ready to listen and to, to make that change happen politically, but it doesn't happen without um, those communities on the ground. Yeah. Amy McMahon, you are pure delight. Thank you so oh, thank much you. for talking to me today and giving My me your pleasure. time. Like, My pleasure. Good luck with the work you are doing. And, um, thank you. Um, I follow you on social media. Now, if people do want to follow you and keep up to date with you and Larissa and Chloe, where can they find you on Instagram? Yeah, or so where, what is your preferred platform? Yeah, there's Facebook. Um, if you just search Amy McMahon Greens, you'll be able to find it on Instagram. I'm Amy Mac South Briz. Um, and the same on um, Twitter as well. Um, if you want to go and have a look there, um, or, you know, pop into our office. We're at, um, 90 Vulture Street in West End. Always happy to uh, have a cup of tea, have a chat. Um, would love that. Lovely. Thank you so much, Amy. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. That was lovely. Oh, what amazing work you are doing. I hope you have all the strength and self-care to keep on doing what it is that you need to do to get out there and meet the people and make the real difference that you want to make. And like you said, 
listening is the absolute key to positive social change. To make people feel heard, valued and visible is where the magic happens. So if you do want to find Amy, she is on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or like she said, rock up to her office in South Brisbane for a cup of tea and a chat. My name's Leanne Butterworth. That was the Empathy Podcast on Empathy and Politics. You can find me at empathyfirst.com.au or for your daily dose of empathy inspiration, go to empathyfirsthq on Instagram. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.